The last 20 years of history have been bookended by two events, 9-11 and COVID-19. Many security experts believe that as cheap and easy to use gene editing tech proliferates, the occurrence of intentional or accidental releases of publicly available viruses like smallpox or engineered variants of bird flu or something else will only become more and more likely. Is there a plan to keep us safe from bio errors or intentional bioterror attacks? Or are we faced with a world where one pandemic following another will become a new normal? What the terrorist really wants to do is disrupt you. Absolutely without question, there will be a major event. The veneer of security on our society is so thin. I'm Cody Sheehy, your host. I'm also the director of the documentary, Make People Better. This film tells the story of how a Chinese scientist secretly created the world's first genetically engineered babies. And I'm your co-host, Samira Kiani, a medical doctor, genetic engineer, and co-producer of the film. You're listening to the Make People Better podcast brought to you by the Random Good Foundation, where we introduce you to the greatest minds and most interesting people at the cusp of a genetic engineering revolution that is transforming science fiction into science fact. In this episode, we're interested in exploring how the science and technology of genetic engineering, which has the potential to transform medicine, but it also is likely to create a terrifying new world plagued with bio-accidents, which we call bio-error, or intentional attacks, which we call bio-terror. So in this hour, we're going to bring you Ed Yu, formerly the special agent for the FBI's Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate, and he's integral to the U.S. government's response to this new threat from biotechnology. And we also talk with Dr. Richard Carmona, formerly a United States Surgeon General. Um, he was tasked with keeping us safe in his tenure. We also talk with Harvard's Sam Weiss and Michael Hotmeyers, who is a private security expert. So let's dive into this troubling future and find out if there's anything that we can do about it after a word from our sponsors. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. The world has always had bad actors, individuals, ideological groups, or nations that for one reason or another seek to inflict violence and chaos into the world. On 9-11, the Western world woke up to a horrific act of terrorism. The global war on terror then transformed how we gather intelligence, treat individual privacy, and it ushered in a new era of trying to predict and prevent events like this from ever happening again. Over the years, new threats have emerged from other domains of technological progress. Cyber attacks have increased exponentially as the digital revolution revealed new vulnerabilities in our digital infrastructure and economy. On top of these, the technologies of gene editing are becoming extremely powerful, cheap, accessible to anyone, and we're forced to recognize yet another new realm for bad actors to play in. This realm was not made of bombs and bullets or digital code, but it's the DNA of our very bodies. And Samara, when we were doing research for this podcast, uh, for this episode, I thought it was fascinating for me to learn that bio attacks are nothing new. I mean, all the way back to medieval times, uh, people were, were loading rotting diseased bodies into catapults and then shooting them over the castle walls to try to infect everybody inside. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an old idea. And then I think it really um, came into its own really in World War I and World War II. I mean, that's when the United States, Japan, and the Soviet Union industrialized this process. I mean, they made massive bioweapons programs. Terrible weapons were tested on literally hundreds of thousands of people. 
It was until the Biological Weapons Convention when they banned such weapons, and it was in 1970s, right, Cody? It's amazing because there's very few treaties around the world where almost all the countries sign it, and that's one of them. And it's protected us pretty well. If you think about it, there hasn't been the use of weapons like that since. But where it's not protecting us are from small, ideological-driven groups or individuals. And I'm thinking of the the sarin gas attack um, from the cult in Japan or the Rajneesh in the United States who conducted like salmonella attacks. By the way, Samara, those attacks, they were in the Dalles, Oregon, which is about three or four hours from where I grew up. So I, I kind of remember that as a kid. Really? Yeah, I, I've, I've watched that documentary and it's, yeah, I've learned <laughs> about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating documentary. It's I recommend it. It's called Wild Wild Country and everyone should watch it. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I have a strange and terrifying tale to tell the house. It is about a town that was poisoned. Who would do such a terrifying thing? Who would poison a whole town? 700 were taken violently ill. Is there a madman lurking in the Dalles? Um, But that was back when I was a kid. And since then, the technologies to really modify the DNA of living organisms has really developed and it's creating a revolution and and we call it the genomic revolution but what does that mean i mean past revolutions like the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution or the the information revolution with the internet today these things transform society that's what we mean when we say genomic revolution it's going to change everything and i think tools such as the crispr technology is making it cheap and easy for anyone to to use it to actually manipulate the DNA code of any organism. That's the reason that we are now in an era of genomic revolution. These kinds of technologies will develop to the point where they're really easy to use and they're really powerful. And I can imagine a world where almost anyone, any school shooter out there who has having a bad day could release a synthetically created virus that just causes a massive pandemic. Um, And in many cases, these viruses already exist and have been published uh, for anyone to have access to. Uh, Although, Cody, I'm not sure we are there. Um, For instance, if you have a very good and high-end painting tools, do you automatically become a good painter? No. You need to learn the knowledge of doing that. You need to practice that. And I guess the CRISPR and other related technologies are just tools. And a lot of knowledge and information needs to be learned and gained. But I can agree with the fact that we are on the path to get there in future if we don't pay close attention to how we develop these technologies. I like the painting analogy, but one that I personally like even better is the analogy with computer hackers. So the early computers were big mainframes in university laboratories or the DOD. They're really hard to access. They're very hard to hack. Um, but as that technology spread and we developed you know, the World Wide Web and, and an internet that, that is connected in our lives in so many ways, uh, the number of hackers and hacks to companies and to individuals has just really exploded. But in this case, they're not going to be hacking our credit cards. The hackers of the future will be hacking our very bodies. Agreed. The other thing I worry about is the COVID pandemic, to me, really demonstrated how difficult it is for public health organizations to contain it. When, when I look at the response we saw to COVID-19 around the world, um, it kind of seemed like it fell into a spectrum of countries that were extremely intent on containing the virus. So I'm thinking of like China with its mm-hmm. massive lockdowns. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have like the United States, which tried to contain it, but really our individual rights are so strong in our society here. Our population really had trouble complying with social distancing even. Mm -hmm. And neither approach really has worked. And that brings up this point that in many ways, we have learned to be reactive to these conditions or situations that arise. I think it's time for us to be proactive, you know, and, and, and learn from the pandemic and predict what can go wrong and start putting measures in place to control them. Okay. I I think you're right. And I think this is also a good place to bring in our first guest, Dr. Richard Carmona. 
Dr. Kamarna was the Surgeon General under the second Bush administration. And we met him where he lives, which is in the hot and dusty town of Tucson, Arizona. I'm Richard Carmona, uh, the 17th Surgeon General of the United States. And during my life, I've had a lot of jobs, been a paramedic, a registered nurse, physician's assistant, ultimately a physician and a general vascular surgeon with subspecialty in traums and trauma and uh, critical care and burns. And um, I have a military background also as a uh, U.S. Army Special Forces soldier and combat medic. Someone told me you were actually county sheriff at one point. Yeah, I uh, have been a deputy sheriff for many years, so I've been in law enforcement. I uh, was on a SWAT team, uh, also was a homicide detective. And from my own life, we're in, you know, we were fairly poor growing up, uh, son of immigrant parents, and uh, understanding the, uh, those inequities firsthand, uh, not having access to health care, not sure where I'm going to get a meal from, being homeless at times. So uh, it was a long road, but boy, uh, the insight you get from actually living those lives is uh, something you can't gain in graduate education. It was important for me in, in the daily briefing we got every morning, which we call the, the presidential briefing we got every morning, was a situational awareness of the world. What's happening? What infections? Who has weapons? What are the bad actors out there, either individual or state-sponsored? And do they have anything that can harm us? And if so, what are our countermeasures? What are we going to do to prevent that bad stuff from coming at us? But even if it isn't in the terrorism realm, I'm interested in a viral infection that may be de developing in South Africa or in Europe, okay? And as we start to characterize that virus, well, how's it coming to us? How long will it take? Is the flu vaccine, for instance, that we have this year going to be an appropriate prevention for that particular virus? Because, you know, they mutate, and every year we have new flu vaccines. So it's a very fluid, dynamic situation where we're planning every day with a multidisciplinary team from NIH, from CDC, from HRSA, from research labs in the military, all of us putting our heads together to try and ensure that we keep our nation safe from any and all hazards. The term we use is all hazards preparedness. And that means nuclear, biological, or chemical threats that may affect us that are either man-made or naturally occurring. Is there a certain signature that you'd be looking for, um, say, like in a bioterrorist event? And often what we look at as patterns of activity. We know that most of those viruses come from overseas. And as we plan our vaccines for the next year, it's looking at the epidemiology of these other countries because we know that those viruses are going to come toward us. So we have the basics understood. But what happens is in our surveillance system, when you start to see occurrences that are out of the norm, lots of people getting sick acutely. So as soon as we see something that is occurring out of the ordinary, we zero in on those patients. Where have you been? Did you travel? Who have you been with? What food are you eating? We take blood samples. We look to see what pathogens may be involved. And then if we find a pathogen that well, this doesn't belong here. There's no reason for us to believe. Now you dig deeper. Where did it come from? Where were you? And then you have to think, is this a naturally occurring phenomenon or is it something that could have been caused purposely to harm us? So-called an engineered um, bacteria or virus that has been weaponized to harm us. Do you think a man-made pathogen would be much worse than something we might discover in a jungle somewhere as we plow down trees? Well, it's an interesting thought, but, you know, through natural evolution, we know that we've seen pathogens that evolve and they become very lethal. And then you have the opportunity for some people to manipulate a pathogen and make it more lethal or take a lethal pathogen and weaponize it so that will harm us. So it's hard to say that one is more lethal than others. So nature could be as big a threat as a military bioweapon made by one nation or another. It doesn't necessarily require a nation state, although with a nation state with resources, it may be easier. But smart people and individually or with a small group can be these independent actors and do those things. But what the terrorist really wants to do is disrupt you. They're better off if they harm you, if they put a huge burden on your healthcare system than just having lots of bodies to put in the freezer. Now, both are terrible, don't get me wrong, but from the, from the eyes of the terrorist, the more that they can do to disrupt your systems of care, take your doctors out of the picture, not enough nurses, not enough ventilators, not enough antibiotics, and all of these people may live, but it may take weeks and months. 
before they come back. But is it getting easier? You know, as we come up with systems where you can just order DNA over the internet and get the DNA that you need, uh, and that the whole system is just becoming more plug and play and more systematic. I, I feel like we're kind of turning it almost into like the computer revolution where you just order your parts and build a computer. This all seems like a tremendous risk. Why is the medical community and our government putting so many resources into developing these technologies? Absolutely. It is worth the risk. And I think we have no choice because it is the next level that we can put into play to benefit mankind, not only to, for disease care or, uh, of, of anything that we talked about, all hazards, man-made or, or um, naturally occurring, but also how do I keep you healthy your whole life? When we know that we're spending $3.4 trillion a year on what we call health care, it's really sick care, and the fact that 75 to 80 cents of every dollar is spent on chronic diseases that we cause, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cancers of all kind, those are all preventable. So think about that. What if I could use the genome with enough data, with predictive analytics, to be able to give you precise information for physician health to optimize your mind, your body, and your spirit to reduce the cost of care, improve the quality and quantity of life. That's the power of the genome that I want to see used as well. And uh, it is very much well worth the cost and well worth any risk to continue on this path of research. Cody, I like where the conversation went. We started with all of these warnings, but then he asked us to look at the good side, right? I think what we heard is that gene editing is really a dual use technology, meaning that it can be used by a terrorist to disrupt our society, but it also has this tremendous potential to improve our health. It's very hard to prevent the advancement of technology because they have the potential to save many lives. I wanted to tell you about my friend, Samara, who he's a lieutenant colonel and he works in the Pentagon. And so his office advises the president if there's going to be a nuclear strike or if we're going to respond to a nuclear strike. It's been really fascinating to, to talk with him a little bit about his job, just because his office spends so much time really thinking about how to prevent countries, you know, even from needing these weapons or how they might reduce weapons to a point where we could someday totally remove nuclear weapons and eradicate them from the face of the earth. But the reality is, in his world, you know, it's been 70 years and there's still some hope that this is going to happen. But the problem is if one country has a nuclear weapon, then everyone else is going to need them too. The best case scenario really is that we had never just invented this nuclear weapon to begin with. And a lot of nuclear uh, proliferation experts really just feel that way about nuclear weapons. And I just bring all this up because I wonder if that's the same kind of mistake that we're making with biotechnology right now. You know, back in 2015 or 2016, DARPA stands for Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, which is one arm of the government, recognized the fact that these genetic technologies are moving fast forward and there is potential of misuse, bio-error or bioterror, but they also recognize that they cannot prevent that. So they formed a program called Safe Genes, where in parallel with the advancement of this technology, the program called for uh, projects and ideas to develop safety countermeasures to be able to prevent the misuse or to be able to shut down these tools if they were spread out in the world. And a lot of interesting work has come out of that. I mean, that is very well-intentioned, I guess. And all the genetic engineers that I've met, you know, in the course of making the documentary or this podcast, I, I agree with you, are well-intentioned, very thoughtful, trying to avoid problems before they happen, which is good. But it reminds me of this nuclear weapons example, though, again, because the, the scientists who are studying the atom and unlocking the secrets of nuclear physics were also very well-intentioned people. I mean, they imagined a world where humans had unlimited energy and we could explore the stars. It was going to be a golden future for mankind. But what happened next was that technology, once it was developed, was taken away and used to build weapons. Now the rest of the world has just lived under this constant threat of annihilation ever since. 
and they were well intentioned, but it didn't work out that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also, when I started really learning about gain of function research, mm-hmm. gain of function is when you are taking some kind of virus or some kind of biological system and intentionally causing it to evolve to gain new functions. And so in the case of of a virus, there's labs that would intentionally breed ferrets that would infect themselves back and forth, back and forth, or in some cases, humanized mice that have mice with a single human cell for every 100 mice cells or something, and help us infect and make that virus more and more deadly. That just seems like that could cause an accident or... I find like gain-of-function research in a dark category. And even if there are well-intentioned scientists, sometimes we are just so blindsided by the question we want to answer that we ignore or fail to see the dark side of the technology. Mm-hmm. I mean, the positive angle of these, you know, gain of function research would be understanding how the pathogen can can be, you know, infecting the host. Right? There's a lot of knowledge that come out of it. But obviously, the negative side is to create more deadly or virulent virus that sometimes they can escape. So these are very, very sensitive areas. There's a lot of responsibility, and there's need to be very conscious about different aspects of. It. So every scientist we've talked to, they're, they have these very clever ways of keeping the labs secure. And they sound bulletproof. But the reality is there have been many accidental releases from even the most high security BSL-4 labs. Right. Um, one example is in the UK, foot and mouth disease, which is a disease that affects cattle, escaped twice, actually, from one of these labs. They had to kill 6 million cattle to stop it. Luckily, they had a surveillance system that detected it early. But imagine if this is humans. Yeah. You can't just kill 6 million humans to stop the spread. That's not plausible. I hear you. So I think all this kind of sums up into what experts call a bio error. And I, and I really like that because it's like a nice play on bio terror, which of course is when someone does this intentionally. I mean, there are really some very clever people out there naming these things. I, I want to shed light to one fact that we sometimes ignore in all of these conversations that scientists are humans that are under tremendous amount of peer pressure to push forward and invent and to be first and take a lot of risks and work long hours just to publish a paper or, or grant in many ways because the livelihoods are really dependent on that. So because of all these pressure, there's a lot of opportunity for them to become tired and make mistake. And so like other human beings working under a lot of tension. They are human and like all humans, if something you've been working on your whole life, some line of research, something like gain of function, there's a little bit of protectionism that can arise around that. that they don't want the funding to be cut off and they don't want their life's work to be to be ended should it develop into a dangerous situation. I, I do think the academic world has been doing a pretty good job at like trying to think ahead and get ahead of this problem. Well, I think we should go to Dr. Sam Weiss. Sam is a research associate professor at Harvard's John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy and physics. My graduate work, I have a master's in management research from Oxford University's uh, Said Business School. I also did my doctorate there, but I was trained by an anthropologist there, and I also have training in international security and in organizational theory and, um, and science and technology studies. I have been focused on security issues in emerging technology for, uh, well, for all of my career. How did you become interested in all of this? Well, the, the catalyst was 9-11, but before that, my, um, my father is a naval submarine captain, right? You know, so I, I grew up in a world of, of security concerns, and, um, but I often went to schools where there were not a lot of military people there. And so I had a kind of penchant for looking at things, how things could go wrong, that I saw other people didn't really. The airplanes flew into the buildings, I looked around. It was like a land of zombies. Nobody knew what to do. No, like ca- classes were canceled for the day. Um, people weren't sure whether they had to go home or like what was going on. And I just sat and I watched everybody. And I was like, this is really interesting. Like the, the, that the veneer of security on our society is so thin that, that a couple of airplanes 
and some box cutters are, are able to, to destroy it like that. The question for me would be, are we, are we enabling a lot more of opportunities for us to be caught in a position where, whereby all of a sudden, you know, we, we see something as very concerning, but it's everywhere. Um, you know, what are we going to do about it? Who are we going to blame? Who's going to be held accountable? Um, and how are we going to change our practices? Think, that, think of how quickly the Patriot Act was passed after 9-11. Did we really have all of that time to think about what was a good idea and how our system should change or not? Um, because who gets the ability to say whether something is a concern or not has a lot of power in, in, in these types of debates, right? Particularly when we're talking about security concern. If you're able to speak in an authoritative manner that something is a security concern, that's often a mechanism to stop other people from talking, to stop other views from getting a seat at the table. And that's concerning to me. If you label something a security concern, then there would be a lot of control and regulation. In certain cases, scientists may actually be following all of the correct regulation, and it's just a case of something going wrong. In other cases, maybe poor judgment on their side, especially about publicly disseminating dangerous information. Right, and, and this was shown in the H5N1 avian influenza. These, the, a set of papers published in 2011 that showed how to make uh, an influenza a strain a lot more transmissible in mammals through aerosol. Right, This is probably worrisome. So there was a paper published in the U.S., paper published in the Netherlands. The only way that the Netherlands was able to really um, at least pause the publication of that was to deny an export license to the, pap to the authors to release the paper to non-Dutch non um, nationals. This is a, what I would call kind of a bastardization of the, of the governance mechanism that we're trying to use here. They, they did proper biosafety protocols. They, you know, notified the authorities that they were working with these, with these things. There were systems in place that were working just fine. And the fact that they didn't catch that there was going to be broader concern here. In this case, the H5N1 case, this is a very dangerous disease. 60% of humans that contract H5N1 die. These scientists were working to make it much easier to spread and publish the detailed data. If that would get into wrong hands or escape from the ferret lab, it really would be a very serious pandemic, one that would completely transform civilization. I would say nuclear war level risks. Are biosecurity experts leading any kind of effort to track what is happening in various labs? Do you do any of that work? Not necessarily me, but people like the FBI, for instance. You know, so the FBI makes a very concerted effort of being familiar to these groups as a resource for them, not as a potential threat to them. So right now we are trending towards a situation where we are just reaching over and over to the latest problem. The last pandemic, the last terrorism attack. Is it going to continue to kind of trip us up over and over and over, and we're going to stumble forward into this technology without ever really getting ahead of it? The technical term is muddling through. So it's like, you know, kind of things happen and we kind of, uh, we, we just deal with what we've got at the time, and then at the next moment we deal with what we've got there. And that's a, that's a normal way of, of doing policy work. You know, there's, there's another approach which I call the whoops then fix approach or the WTF approach to governance, you know, which is something goes catastrophically wrong and you're like, wow, like we need to fix that. And, and then you, you put together something that's usually whatever the nearest ideas are that you have. And then you have a new system, right? And, and everybody's like, oh yeah, it's fixed or it's not fixed. You know, <laughs> There are lots of reasons to be concerned about that as a, as a way to move forward. I think the the thing that we need to be looking for is trying to create the opportunity to have conversations about large systemic change without those kinds of catastrophic events because we, we are getting to the level in a lot of areas of, of technology now that those kinds of events are existential. Samara. I'm still thinking about the H5N1 story. 
so this virus kills 60% of humans. And then this research group made it more transmissible, meaning that it'd be easier for it to spread between people. So that is really stupid to do that. It's dangerous, I think. I love the conversation, realizing that we need to talk with the FBI. So setting this meeting up did not prove to be an easy task, but eventually we were invited to the J. Edgar Hoover Building in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to jump in with a quick little FBI story here. Do you remember when we were out on the street? They didn't let us in right away. We have all of our gear piled up on the curb. Right. And we're waiting. And the time that they were supposed to meet us or let us in had passed. And we weren't sure what was going on. And then this guy is walking down the street, kind of a wearing a suit, kind of shaved head. And he comes up to me and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, uh, you know, making a documentary. He's like, oh, what about? And he just starts like <laughs> probing me. And I'm looking at this guy and he's obviously an FBI agent. He's just kind of interviewing us out on the street. And then I guess we passed the test because they, they let us in. <laughs> they let us in. And we were able to sit down with Ed Yu. My name is Edward Yu. I'm a supervisory special agent. At that FBI. time, Ed Yu was the special agent for the FBI's Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate. He has since taken on a new position as the National Counterintelligence Officer for Emerging and Disruptive Technologies. Well, first, let's look at biology. It's inherently open. It's the strength of the field. It's sharing. It's You're talking about materials that are often readily available in nature and in the environment. So it's a completely different way of attr- approaching security in such that You have to be sensitive in how do we address the security aspects of it without actually hindering scientific progress. The barriers to entry to potentially do something, either mischievous or criminal, is getting lower and lower. So it's incumbent upon the FBI to engage with the scientific community who are the practitioners who are pushing the envelope. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be the FBI who determines what's normal and what's abnormal. We're not the proverbial big brother. That's not our mandate. That We don't even have the resources to see what's going on. But that's why we're really dependent upon these partnerships with the scientific community because if you're working and slaving away in the lab all day, all night, then really the true sentinels of being on the lookout for suspicious activity are the people who are actually working in there. What's a, a terror scenario that you worry about the most? I mean, that really keeps you up at night. So there are a couple of uh, scenarios. Um, so one that's specifically synthetic biology. That, uh, the, in back in 2006, a reporter for The Guardian submitted an email order to a company that synthesizes DNA. And a few weeks later, got a little plastic vial in the mail, and inside the vial was the DNA for smallpox. And the resulting story was the laws are lax that it doesn't prevent somebody from ordering smallpox and, or, or terrorists potentially from getting it in the mail. With that close call today, DNA companies, when they get orders, they actually screen the DNA sequence to determine what it is that they're making. And they actually sequence the customers, too, to determine who they're selling it to. Do you feel like you have the resources that you need to adequately address the threat risk across this country and, and maybe from, from any country? Well, I won't speak on funding, that's not that, but um, one of the programs that we are very much in support of is being sponsors of iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. So FBI as being one of the sponsors, we actually go to iGEM every year that we have a workshop called Safeguarding Science in the Future. We man a table and um, engage with the students directly. And a really good example is a team that came out of um, Beijing in 2010. The students did their synthetic biology scientific project, but after hearing the security message that we brought, they decided to do a security side project. And what they did is they identified 17 Chinese-based biotech companies that had potentially very dangerous products. So the students just used a personal credit card, a residential address, and a personal email account, and they sent in orders for across all those companies. And to their shock and dismay, they found out that 16 out of the 17 companies were actually going to ship and deliver these potentially dangerous uh, products to a residential address. But then bear in mind, too, that uh, we run the real risk if, in the name of security, if we 
make it difficult to innovate, then you're going to counter the ability to come up with new medicines, new vaccines, new, new biodefenses. The biggest bioterrorist out there is <clears throat> Mother Nature. As this technology becomes more and more ubiquitous, could that scenario shift to where if there's a single person out of out of 7.9 billion people on the planet, a single bad actor could have the same power that Mother Nature has had all these years? So if I can borrow a, a term from the cyber realm, which actually is appropriate because there are a lot of parallels between bio and, and where we're seeing the cyber world going, yeah, that one black hat that might be in the population to inoculate against that is basically reaching out with the population now, educate and develop a big population of white hats. That if you have enough white hats out there, it'll accomplish many things. One, identify potential black hat activity, but then also very rapidly develop the counters to whatever the black hats deploy. I mean, in the cybersecurity realm, this threat is not actually being met. Some people wonder if we design the internet differently with these security threats in mind ahead of time. Are we making that same mistake right now? And that's the whole premise of uh, the FBI's outreach is that we're laying that groundwork now today when the, the time where biotechnology becomes that powerful and that pervasive, we're getting that understanding out there right now. In terms of the technological approaches we can take, can you tell us a little bit about this network of DNA um, sniffers that are across the country sampling air? Uh, that we breathe. So what are the sniffers looking for? Is that something that you can comment on? Yeah, you would ha you have to speak to someone in at Dome, uh, Homeland Security for that one. Do you worry more about the DIY community or say a rogue scientist or a nation state? Like which of these areas do you think we need to focus on the most? It could be a criminal interest. It could be a, a nation state actor or a lone, lone wolf. It could be anybody. We just don't know. Do you think the American public should really just assume that probably this is just something we're going to have to like live with? The first one's going to happen at some point, and then there's going to be another one and another one. And are, are we just going to basically adjust to it? Is that what the future looks like? Um, I think that's going to have to be accepted by the population. But that doesn't mean that you just sit idly by. It does mean that there is something you can do about it. There's something that it's within your power to take action. And whether it's developing a new vaccine, yeah, there are going to be some vulnerabilities and risks, but don't forget, there's a flip side to it, a really big, big flip side is that there are so many powerful solutions that can come out of biology, potential improvements to health, agriculture, renewable energy may all come from bio. Our next and last stop, Samara, is the future. Michael Hotmeyer, who is a security expert, and I would argue a little bit of a futurist, has spent a lot of time working with the government to unpack problems that are likely to face us in the near future. And the future he sees is one where biotech is just done everywhere, by everyone, and that the risk is high and that there's very little we can do about it. And it's really just up to us to accept and adjust. My name is Michael Hopmeyer. started my career uh, with degrees in mechanical engineering. Uh, began early in my career as a combat weapon systems test engineer, eventually went into a variety of other areas, including biodefense, uh, counter WMD and counter terrorism. I've been on Defense Science Board, Intelligence Science Board, National Academy of Sciences panels over the last 30 years. I've held a number of, of positions as advisor, consultant with DARPA, the Army Medical Research and Materiel Command, Marine Corps Chem Bio Incident Response Force. Most recently, been doing work with the World Health Organization, doing ground security and field operations for the health security interface program and mass gatherings. What does a significant event mean? Theoretically, you can have an existential event where we're going to have the zombie apocalypse and you know wipe all human life off the face of the earth. From a practical point of view, I don't think that that's a, a very high probability. 
the real challenge is going to be, and I, and I always find it interesting when people talk about what happens if the economy fails, what happens if public health collapses. Those are somewhat misnomers. The real thing is, what is the new level of stasis that we achieve? What is the new standard that, that comes out? It may be that a lot more people are breathing on oxygen, for example. It may be that general health goes down, that hospitals are overcrowded for a little while till we reach a new static state. So an event effectively is anything that has a significant impact on an individual small group or society, depending on what scale you're looking at. What is the U.S. government doing to protect us against us? The FBI is extraordinarily good at collecting intelligence, analyzing, and identifying threats, and then being able to counter those threats. One of the challenges that I've seen in dealing with biosecurity is traditionally it is the focus of the professional and academic community writing and preparing the professional and academic community without a real recognition that much more broadly we've got a, a growing community of people who have neither formal training nor in many cases any contact at all with the professional bioresearch, biodefense, or biosecurity community. They aren't biologists, they aren't academics, they don't do it as a profession, they do it as a hobby. Unfortunately, that community, which is growing at a faster rate than all of other aspects of biology combined is being almost completely left out of these discussions. And the primary challenge is, while we can create defined checklists and dogma, this community has nothing to do with that. They have no knowledge and generally no interest. Um, are, are you familiar with the, the parable of the infinite number of monkeys? A long time ago, somebody pointed out that if you have an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters and an infinite amount of time, they'll be able to recreate the works of Shakespeare. Well, we don't have an infinite number of monkeys and typewriters, but as we grow and grow in the number of people that are playing in biology as a hobby, the probability of something screwing up keeps going up and up and up. The bottom line is, if something is technically possible, it's going to be done. We don't have the ability to track that. And I think it's incredibly unfair and unwise to push organizations like the FBI to try and develop knowledge and capability to track those people. So you think the FBI will fail at this? Define fail. That there will be a major attack or something along the lines of a major accident? Absolutely. There is no question about it in my mind. Now, whether it's next year, 10 years, 30 years, Absolutely, without question, there will be a major event, whether it is accidental or intentional. No doubt whatsoever. The key is, look at those things that will have the greatest impact in reducing the probability of a significant event, and at the same time, taking advantage of the science and technology that we have to develop countermeasures and methods of being able to mitigate or affect some of those potential accidents. Do you know anything about the biosensing network that would potentially be installed across the United States um, and kind of detect these changes in genetic information? Which okay. one? There have been a number of them in various incantations for at least two decades now. Every few years we have a new surveillance system, usually generated by a new contractor who wants to make more money and put another system out there, or another SES in the government who's trying to make rank or something, decides to rename it, do the same crap again. But there is a perception, especially among senior policy makers, that when you have a surveillance system, any of the biosensing systems, any of the detection systems, anything, that you're going to have the, the secretary's command center, and everybody's going to be there drinking coffee, talking about you know Monday night football, and all of a sudden, alarms are going to go off, lights are flashing, you're going to see a world map and expanding circles around someplace. And they're going to say, right here, a bug has jumped from a pig into a human being, and we now have the start of the zombie apocalypse. Bullshit. What really ends up happening is a lot of these events are going on all the time, and we never catch or detect them at all. At some point, they reach a threshold where we're aware that something anomalous or unusual has occurred, but that awareness normally happens weeks to months after the events really occurred. It's already out in the wild. You're there now trying to stop something that is already a problem, and generally without a clear understanding of even the extent of that problem. 
Do you think human civilization can keep up with the big changes that are coming? Yes, they will. I mean, if, 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 you, if I tell you no, they can't keep up, what, what does that look like? I, and, and this is like, okay, can our banking system adapt to another depression? Well, I don't know what it would look like if it didn't adapt. Yes, it will adapt. So will civilization be different? Absolutely. So the new tech just keeps coming and piling up on top of us, and those interactions just create a new normal. We don't intentionally adapt, it just sort of happens to us without our direction to it. For example, take a look at the fact that we've got bridges that are 150 years old and collapsing at the same time that we're deploying 5G telecommunications capability. I think what you're asking is what's popularly known in science fiction as the singularity. Do we have a point where we start accelerating in primarily societal change beyond anything that we've ever seen before, where in a matter of one or two generations, the new steady state is unrecognizable from the old steady state? Um, you know, it's... It's a cool idea. I don't anticipate that because we have such an enormous legacy infrastructure. But the point is, I don't think we're going to hit a singularity. I think what we're going to have is what we are already seeing now and have seen over and over and over again, a discontinuity or an impedance mismatch between different aspects of society. That's where we have the friction and the challenge. Join us for the next episode, where we will be exploring the culture of the tech companies and visionaries that are driving the genomic revolution, and how, in many ways, they are modeling themselves after their predecessors in Silicon Valley. The culture of move fast, break thing epic is being used as a justification to move the technologies of life far past what the rest of society is prepared for spiritually. Please support this podcast by sharing it and leave us a review. We would also love to add your voice to this conversation. We'll be hosting a live discussion around this topic and you're invited to join. Check the show notes for details. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. Thanks, and we'll talk with you again soon.